Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are returning to War in the Pacific Admiral's Edition, our Let's Play series against Evoken. This is May 10th, 1942, and we are in the process of shifting some of our carriers out to South Africa so they can get some of the early 1942 upgrades done, and it really does feel like we're in a bit of a period of transition. We've had over 200 combat aircraft arrive in India at Karachi in the last few days. We've had an American combat regiment arrive there as well, and we are, I think, in it, firmly in the phase of the Allied strengthening. Oh, there's a hit, but no explosion. Some things change, some things remain the same. Uh, but we are firmly in the period of Allied strengthening. It is not yet to sort of the uh, massive mobilization period. We don't have the Essexes coming on the line. We're still a year away from that. Uh, but we've at least gotten to the point where we have considerable ground forces that are becoming available to us, considerable land-based air forces that are becoming available to us, and we're starting to get a wider array of options in terms of responding to the Japanese threat. The Japanese are still clearly on the offensive. They clearly have the initiative, uh, but hopefully things will begin to shift soon and we at least have the ability to pick and choose our spots at this point and respond to and fight them. Uh, we have issued uh, a couple of orders for some of our, well I already said that, some of our carriers moving west uh, to get refits and I have also started toggling some of my own logistics uh, but before we get to that we have a lot of pilots who are about to die. <laughs> Oh no, uh, looks like our uh, torpedo bombers spotted a Japanese uh, surface task force that was worth torpedoing, but they flew without any escorts, and so we have 14 Albacore ones of the Royal Air Force, I believe, uh, flying with torpedoes and absolutely no escorts uh, against more than almost 60 Japanese fighters who are bouncing them, so that's great. I'm sure actually the Albacore crews are probably decent too if they're from the fleet air arm. Um, I'll have to take a look at the particular squadron, but this squadron is going to cease to exist because torpedo bombers against 16 fighters where they don't, it's not like Midway, we haven't caught them off guard with a whole wave of, uh, of attacks. These guys are coming in, getting bounced and getting rocked. Uh, this is probably the most substantial engagement air engagement we've had in quite a while actually unfortunately it, it's resulting in us getting slaughtered um and us sending many pilots to either their deaths or a period of time where they're going to be floating out at sea on rafts and i'm not really sure with this particular air attack tavoy is in japanese hands mole mine is in allied hands i'm not sure if they come ashore whether they will end up being becoming POWs. Uh, prisoners of war or whether there's a chance that we could recover them because pilots can go missing and then you can recover them and they can rejoin your ranks or they can become you know prisoners of war and a lot depends where the actual battle takes place combat report is saying that there were nine albacores destroyed i'm guessing it was all of them it looks like the japanese fighters that were over the uh, the task force that we were trying to bomb uh, are fighters from the hosho one uh, and the 77th sentai uh, so Oscar 1Cs and Zeros, carrier-based Zeros, although I'm assuming they were probably put on land uh, and flying from land bases rather than a carrier. Could be wrong on that, but that's my assumption. I think we've seen the Hosho Zeros there previously, so we'll have to take a look at some things. we got another raid coming in here, apparently. I also sent some Catalinas out. Again, I must have stood the fighters down or changed their orders or something because there's no fighter escorts here. And we've got six Catalinas coming in as well. Catalinas carry two torpedoes, actually, so they make pretty pretty decent, if very vulnerable, torpedo uh, bombers. Uh, but I don't think any of them are going to make it through either, because, again, they're facing basically 60 enemy fighter aircraft. This is going to be a good day for the Japanese. They're going to get a lot of kills. Uh, their pilots are going to gain some experience, and they're going to they're gonna sort of ladder up the zero charts. Not zero, the ace charts uh, of the game, so... Looks like those uh, Catalinas got wiped out. It only said one was destroyed, but we'll have to see what the post-battle uh, report is. And another raid coming in. It looks like the two remaining Albacores, I believe it was a squadron of 16. The two came in a separate raid. Only 36 of the Zeros engaged, but uh, they're getting wiped again. 
Um, the Japanese, we just didn't have enough aircraft to burn through the Japanese ammunitions. It's, it's possible that if you have enough aircraft, the enemy will actually run low on ammo and whatnot, but, um, and have to land and resupply. And sometimes you can sneak through in that case, but don't think that's happening there. They're just all dying. That was all in the air, uh, the AM phase, wasn't it? Or was that the PM phase? I lost track. That was the PM phase. We're straight into land combat. Okay. All right, so we've got the Japanese uh, bombarding at Batavia. All right, so no no more assaults there quite yet. It seems to be a larger bombardment though. It seems like they maybe included more than just the artillery units in the bombardment. Uh, the counter battery fire on our end actually was pretty effective. 106 Japanese casualties, two squads destroyed, three disabled. We did lose five squads disabled, but or destroyed and one disabled. So they had an advantage slightly there, but three, two, but that's a that's a pretty good counter battery result, I think. Um, show. I'm not sure. I feel like I've used the uh, the Catalinas fairly effectively with our torpedoes, as opposed to the. Um, the Devastators, which... Is it the Devastator? Which, uh, which don't generally fare very well. Uh, another bombardment attack at Clark Field. That didn't go very well. Or didn't for, didn't really go poorly either. Major Stranzer, thank you very much for the resub. Appreciate the support. Two months now. Good to see you once again. And I think that does it for this turn. So we'll have to jump in and take a look. EBD, the Devastator. This TBD torpedo bomber destroyer? Or Devastator? What does TBD even stand for? I've, I, I, I've seen the abbreviation, but I don't know what the torpedo bomber Douglas. Okay. That's your standard TLA, three-letter three acronym. All right, let's jump in here, take a look at the losses. So let's get a Rangoon. It's actually probably, it, it, all things aside, despite the fact that we lost quite a few aircraft, it's probably actually not the worst result. The worst result would have been if we had sent like 20 P-30, you know, P-38s on escort duty and they got eviscerated because they were going three to one against enemy aircraft. Like that would have been worse than just losing a fair a, a squadron a fairly low value aircraft here you can see this is the 273rd squadron of the raf so they're not actually fleet air arm they're raf uh, and they lost every single aircraft boys <laughs> all 16 albacores were lost in air-to-air -air combat last turn um so not a good result <laughs> the squadron doesn't exist it looks like eight pilots got back maybe or were drawn from replacements no i think they got back or they didn't fly they could have been spare pilots who didn't have planes lucky to be you boys not to be sent off on that uh, that raid our catalina groups also pretty much got wiped out they didn't all get shot down the catalina is a little bit tougher two engine larger aircraft Looks like none of them are serviceable in the uh, this squadron, but uh, at least two are being repaired. They lost two air-to-air, -air, one op, so half the squadron, I think. And then this one has one ready and two under repair. So again, they didn't shoot every, every Catalina down from this particular raid. If we take a look at the actual aircraft losses today, 16 Albacores all lost in air-to-air -air combat. Two PBY-A Catalina 5As shot down in air-to-air, -air, no ops. One PBY-5 Catalina lost in air-to-air, -air, no ops. So we lost three of the six Catalinas that flew, so half of the of those. And then we lost all of the Albacores that flew. Uh, so 20 aircraft lost for the Allies today against one Japanese. The Japanese aircraft lost was a zero, which was an ops loss, so presumably... They were flying a, a long-range cap over that task force, and one of the aircraft was either damaged in the fight or just perhaps crashed due to mechanical failures. We take a look at pilots lost. Four pilots were killed in action this last turn. I mean, we didn't send any fighters, so it's not like any of our aces were lost, but we did lose four pilots, KIA, 
Four pilots were wounded in action, presumably in the Catalinas that got back or maybe in Albacore that was rescued. And then we had 10 pilots that are missing in action. Uh, and so that means they could end up becoming either killed. They could becoming they could end up being captured by the Japanese, which effectively killed because they're removed from from the ability to do anything with them. Um, or uh, they could end up becoming, we could rescue them. You know, we could find them floating in the ocean or whatever. Uh, I don't know the odds of that. I know when you fly over friendly territory, the odds of missing crews being rescued is better, but I don't really know all the mechanics of how that works. Uh, so so there you go. Um, 10, 10 MIA, 5 wounded, and 4 killed. That could have been worse. It could be up to 14 KIA, but we'll see, or 14 KIA slash POW either, either way. No ships sunk, I don't think, this turn. Nope, nothing was sunk this turn. Uh, in terms of what they were flying after, we didn't even get into sight with them, but it looks like it is a squad or a task force of two destroyers and an APD. Makes me wonder what they're actually doing. I suppose they could be trying to close Rangoon to shipping, which is not a bad thing for them to try and do because we do have uh, we do have this task force here that uh, is uh, is a cargo task force which was on its way into Rangoon. I did order it back to Ramiri Island, but I wonder the Japanese have detected it. I guess that's my concern is they got a 10 and 10 out of 10 detection. So they know it's here. We could throw a combat air patrol over the group and possibly have a chance if the Japanese launch a bombing attack against them to do some damage to their bombers. They do have 113 fighters flying out of Bangkok now. They actually pulled all their fighters out of Chiang Mai. So they do have a considerable amount of fighter aircraft there. If we were to put the bulk of our fighters here uh, that I moved into Rangoon in the last couple of turns, we could have a pretty decent chance. We've got uh, a squadron of 26 crack P-38E Lightning pilots. The P-38 can fly higher and faster than the Japanese, so it can dive on them. The Hurricane actually also has a better ceiling than the Japanese planes as well. So it can dive on them as well, which gives a big advantage. So we could, you know, we could have a reasonable fight there against 100 Japanese uh, planes. We'd have, what, like 48 Hurricanes and 26 Lightnings. So all told about 70 aircraft that either equal or outclass the Zero. And then we could throw in another 50 Warhawks just to keep them off balance. That is an option. Um, we could also throw them in a long-range cap over here to protect the shipping as it moves in from Japanese bombing attacks. The real concern at that point is this task force has no escorts. And so if the Japanese do send a task force, a surface task force out against them, we probably won't fare very well. Um, uh, they'll get destroyed at sea. Uh, we have a second task force over here, which has not been detected yet, uh, which is made up of uh, AKLs as well, although it does have a nominal escort of some mine layers. They're not going to stop a destroyer, but they at least exist. Both these task forces are low on fuel. We have enough fuel with these guys if we want to run them into, into Rango, and I think on flank speed we might be able to do it. Yeah, we could just barely get them into, into port if we move them at flank speed here, although I'm a little worried they'll stop to replenish off of the Hamakua uh, because these guys are all pretty low, and this one is better fuel, so it's possible they might stop uh, and do underway replenishment amongst each other, which would be bad. Um, my hope is that this task force sprinted up to Rangoon in one turn and now is retreating back to Tavoy to refuel. That might actually give us a turn to get into port. We can move three hexes at flank speed per phase. So when the sun comes up, we would be here. So we wouldn't yet be in Rangoon. If they do blitz up, then we'd be exposed in daylight. And we our, our fighters might keep enemy aircraft off us, maybe. But we're not likely to keep the enemy shipping off us. Um, I do, I think, have a few more aircraft at Rangoon I could order into, into attacks, but that may not be wise, given what we saw last turn. If I'm trying to do combat air patrol while also doing attack raids, I probably don't have enough fighters for that. We do have a few Vindicators here, um, so we could do some dive bombing of Japanese ships, but they're not very good crews. They probably wouldn't perform very well. 
Uh, we could also move in some other aircraft out of Ch uh, Chittagong. I think we've got some 17s. We could do some skip bombing, but again, not great crews for naval attack. So I'm not really sure what to do there. I'm tempted to just try and run them in and see what happens. I mean, they're not very valuable ships. Their victory points are one, so they, they're kind of not expected to survive. What's the upgrade even do for them? It gives them some 50 cals. Right now, they don't even have any ability to shoot back against... These guys have no guns. Look, nothing under the device category. Nothing. You can do an upgrade in January or in February that gives them 50 cal machine guns, gives them four 50 cals. But these, uh, most of these, these ships have no defense. The uh, Hemakua, which is actually a uh, American, a U.S. Navy merchant marine ship, uh, has 30 cals. It has six 30 cals. That's not going to do much either. As an upgrade coming in June, that'll give it Orlicons. That'll give it some punch. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they're not great. Yeah, I mean, they're expendable, JD. Uh, listen, I'm sorry if, if folks don't want to hear it, but sometimes the truth hurts. Sometimes you, the individual sailor, soldier, airman, your life is, is, doesn't factor in the, uh, the grand calculus of, of the war. Um, so... You know, don't don't let the sailors, soldiers, and Marines hear that. Like, that doesn't mean their lives don't matter. Everybody's lives matter. But, it you know, sometimes the, the value or the value of possibly getting 13,000 supplies into Burma outweighs the risk. You know? Anyway. Uh, because, yeah, I would like to get more supplies into uh, into Rangoon before uh, before the Japanese really strengthen their their control around here. I suspect what uh, Evoken might be doing is building up his air forces in Bangkok and Tavoy, using that to shut down any ability to bring supplies in via the coast, and then just slowly starving our troops out of Burma. I think we have enough local production to keep a moderate amount of supply, but once a campaign starts, um, because Burma makes its own supply, but once a campaign starts and bombing starts and active fighting starts in Burma, that supply is going to become very insufficient very quickly. I did have this like fanciful idea of bringing the New Orleans and Perkins and Warden two destroyers and a heavy cruiser down to Rangoon to defend these guys, like pull them back for a few turns, let them refuel at Calcutta for another run. And then when they're ready, send a heavy cruiser escort in with them. But then that just exposes us to air attack from, from Japanese bombers against actually valuable ships. So I don't know if I want to do that or not yet. Um, meanwhile, in terms of what's going on this turn, we have shipping, moving around, stuff happening, people. Uh, it looks like we've got 44,000 fuel on the way to Perth from South Africa. They'll arrive on map in 16 days. Uh, we've got about 74,000 cargo on the way to Albany, um, as well as some fuel. They'll arrive on map in 11 days. Where's Albany again? Oh, down here, southern tip of Australia. So that'll be nice. Uh, we also have some additional ships that have arrived at Cape Town. Um, and so we've got some ships that are actually loading up uh, with, with fuel or unloading with fuel. We've got uh, a large tanker task force. I believe they arrived from, I don't even know. I think they came from the U.S. West Coast but they carry up to 90,000 fuel with them, and they just unloaded at Cape Town. And then we have other tankers and whatnot that we're going to load up and send to uh, to Australia, or we already actually did. That was the 74,000 fuel that I mentioned. Um, or 44,000 fuel that I mentioned here. So these guys are on their way to Perth. We actually ordered these guys to load up last turn. So they loaded pretty damn quick. Um, the Battleship Prince of Wales out of commission for two more days. She's transferring into active service. So she'll be going to the British Isles soon. The carriers of ours have made it off the map here that we're going to South Africa uh, for their refits. And so these guys are here. They're on their way to Cape Town. They are six days away. At full speed, I've switched them over to full speed because I think once you're off map, you don't consume fuel. I think, I guess we'll see how quickly that fuel goes down. 
If it does, we might have to switch their speed back. But if I don't go to full speed, it's like a 12 day journey. So I'd love to save six days and get them there that much more quickly. Uh, we've also begun the refit process in Colombo. So I mentioned moving some ships to Colombo and doing some on map upgrades that pose us some risk. If the Japanese bomb Colombo, then obviously these guys could be bombed in port and destroyed. Uh, but we're taking the risk. We've got three light cruisers that are going undergoing their refits. It'll take about 20 to 16 days. And then we've got two destroyers that'll take 13 days each to complete their up upgrades or refits. Um, and then uh, once the uh, carriers do their upgrades and refits in Colombo, then we'll go ahead and send them to, uh, uh, to probably to Pearl. In terms of how one wins the game, so the game keeps track of victory points. You can see down here in the bottom left of the intelligence screen, Japan has 15,000, the Allies have 10,000. So victory points determine who wins. You get victory points by holding different objectives. So you can see, for example, Singapore here is worth 2,000 to the Allies. It is worth 460 to the, to the Japanese. So different victory points, different locations have different strategic values to different countries. Um, we actually lost quite a few victory points when the Japanese took New Caledonia, I believe it was. Uh, Nomaya was worth 300 to the Allies. Not actually that valuable to the Japanese, only worth 30 to the Japanese, but worth 300 to the Allies. Comac was worth five to the Allies. Uh, Esprit de Santu was worth 550 to Japan. It's a really good anchorage. Worth less to the Allies. I'm not quite sure why. Um, or to Japan. I'm guessing it's worth less to Japan because it's so... Or no. It is 550. So I, I don't know why New Caledonia would be worth less to the Japanese than it is the Allies. I, I don't know. But in any event, the victory points determine who's going to win. I believe if you get... I don't, I'm not sure exactly what the final tally is at the end of the game. I think there's a range that's pretty close to one to one, which is a draw at the end of the game. Um, and then if you have like past that, past certain thresholds, then it's either a major or a minor victory for either side. The Japanese also have some special rules where if the Japanese have three times the allied vic score, so if they were to have 30,000 and we kept 10,000, at the end of 1942, then the Japanese win, would win an auto victory at the end of 1942. At the end of 1943, if the Japanese have double the Allied victory points, then the Japanese win an auto victory. And if they don't win an auto victory by the end of 1943, then the game can play out all the way into 1946, uh, where the game will end in early 1946, uh, no matter what. Um, but the Japanese can be forced to surrender before that. Also, there's some other mechanic around atom bombs where, like, the Allies can use up to two atom bombs penalty-free. But if they start dropping, like, I want to say, like, if they drop a fourth atom bomb or a fifth atom bomb toward the end of the game, the more they use, it it's, it prevents them from winning a major victory, and it kind of goes to a minor victory, I assume. I'm assuming it has something to do with some sort of political cost for basically eviscerating the entire Japanese home island. There's a, there's a lot of different ways that victory conditions can unfold in this game. Uh, meanwhile, if we take a look at China right now, um, not a lot has changed this turn. I, I don't see much different. Quilin is up to 92% fortifications. We're trying to get her up to a level, or 92% of the way to level four forts. I really want to get Quilin to level four. I've also issued some orders. We had some troops, and I'm not sure why, but the third new Chinese corps was heading to Burma, and they got almost to the border there. They're not part of a larger unit, though. I don't see the point in moving these guys to Burma. Um, I don't have enough Chinese squads or other things in the pools right now to, like, make them a super unit. Burma usually has more supplies than China, so you can more effectively upgrade your units or, or equip them with better stuff. But at least in the case of the third new Chinese Corps, they're already decently equipped. Uh, they're decently trained at 53 experience. I'm actually going to move them to Quilin to try and help reinforce that southern thrust because I really think, I don't have a reason for thinking this yet. It's just what I would do, so that's, I guess that's dangerous. But I think what the Japanese are going to do is they're going to try and use these really good road and railways in the south of China to take Quilin, take Luchao, take Nanning, open up a, a major road corridor to Vietnam and into Singapore to allow transportation of resources into China from Singapore to allow them to more efficiently move their oil. Uh, but I also think if they're going to make a move on Chungking, it's going to come one of two ways. It's either going to come in the north through Cyan and then the mountain passes, 
or it's going to come in the south through Quilin and up through this major roadway because these roadways are so good. And so I'm planning on putting a defensive line in place here. We've got some troops out here in the mountains. We're also building up the fortifications at Quilin, and then we'll continue building up the fortifications along this along this route here north to south. Um, and so I'm going to bring this core back toward there. I'm probably also going to bring the um, the sixth Chinese core, which is also going to was going to Burma. Again, not quite sure why they're going that way. We do have the fifth Chinese core already in position, so we did deliberately move some Chinese units into Burma to help the defense there. Um, and so we actually have uh, the fifth Chinese core all in Burma right now. There are four of the six units for the six divisions are at Rangoon. Two are at Lashou. We're going to order the units at Lashou to move to Rangoon. And once they all arrive, if we wish, we can combine all these divisions into one core. That would give us a pretty damn potent core right now. You can take a look here. It would give us, what, over three, four, almost 500 assault value um, just amongst them, which is like a Western division. Uh, but then these units also have considerable upgrade potential. The 96 core, for example, or the 96 division, for example, can all, can draw up to 240 Chinese squads. The 36 division also can more than double its its strength uh, that is currently currently there. 96 can almost double its strength. So, like a lot of these units have a lot of room to upgrade. I, I suppose maybe we were moving the the third new Chinese core. Just because there's, they can actually get up to 800 rifle squads and become just as deadly as the fifth. But I don't have any Chinese squads in reserve that we can pull. Like, we get 300 a month. So in theory, we'll have a bunch before too long. But I don't know. It just doesn't seem likely that we're going to be able to outfit both the fifth core and the third new Chinese core. Maybe I'll reconsider it before I send uh, send some stuff over. Uh, also, yes, the Chinese can be triggered. Uh, the Soviets join, I believe, by default, the Soviets join by their historical date um, in the event that nothing happens sooner. But if you don't trigger them, if you don't wait till then, if the Japanese withdraw too many units out of Manchuria or Manchuko, um, and then the, then the Soviets will be like, Aha! The Japanese have left their northern flank exposed! Let's strike a blow! And then the, the Soviets will get into, get into action early. So the Japanese have a garrison requirement to keep a considerable amount of forces in Manchukuo to prevent the Soviets from coming into the game. Um, but uh, if they fail to do that, they can definitely be triggered and you can, you can have the Soviets on your side. If the Japanese do that, they're fucking toast. Like, the, the Soviet forces are very well mechanized, very efficient, and uh, they will... Uh, they will I'm not saying it's impossible because I have seen some AARs where Japanese players will deliberately trigger the Soviet intervention early um, just as a different way of playing, I guess. I don't think any I've ever seen anyone say it's a smart thing to do, but if you're up for a challenge, I suppose, it could be something you would do. I think it's like 9,000 AV. It's like something really high. I, maybe it's 8,000. It's, it's a lot. It's a considerable, it's like 20 divisions worth of troops that they have to keep there. Um, I don't know that we have a lot of other updates for this turn, though. The, the troops in Clark Field continue to not be in good shape from a supply perspective, so the Allies are going to surrender there before too long. Batavia did have that one bombardment. It wasn't, like, too much. Um, assault strength is at 940. I can't remember if that increased or decreased over last turn. I think it came up by 40, though. I want to say it came up by 40. I think it was, like, low 900s, and now it's, like, mid 900s this turn. Um, we have still 31,000 supply there. So pretty good amount. Uh, we are also continuing to pull troops out of the Prohoda garrison. So, um, you can see here that, uh, we're down to 11 combat squads here in this KNL unit, uh, which is on a different Island. The only Island left in the sort of Java, uh, Dunsapar, Sumba, Timor area. That's still in Dutch control. Uh, we're trying to pull those guys out uh, and bring them to Batavia because they're going to be more useful there. Um, we have a couple of like stranded units and we've got one, one base up here in sort of Northwestern Sumatra that still hasn't fallen. Interestingly enough. Um, 
Not sure. What what are these ships here? What's a Copang? Looks like some harbor stuff. Uh, if we take a look at the SIGINT, any new intel here? I wish we got more ship information. The game gives you a ton of information about different ground units, and sometimes these radio transmissions indicate locations of ships, but I wish we got a little bit more specific information about shipping, especially in the May June time frame 1942 when sort of Allied SIGINT was kind of probably at its best in the war. But, yeah. Anyway, uh, anything else you guys want to know before we wrap this particular episode up? Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts uh, for at least another hour, maybe two, of, uh, of live stream in action. Did I set up my Southwest Pacific Australia defenses in any particular way? Um, I don't know. I mean, we set up, we, we created what we called the Fiji line, uh, which is some strength at, on the island of Suva in the Fiji group. We also have a, a strong base at Pago Pago, and then we've landed a Marine detachment at Savi. We took that back from the Japanese. So like Suva itself has about 300 assault value, We've got the one New Zealand brigade that uses regular troops. So this is a very good New Zealand unit, at least the best New Zealand unit that you have uh, from a combat perspective because they upgraded from militia to regular infantry. We have the 161st U.S. Infantry Regiment, part of the 25th Infantry Division. Um, we'll probably build that into a full division eventually. The 35th and the 27th both are, I believe, HQ locked. They are. We do have enough AV. We could actually unlock one of these guys and move him to Suva. And we could form the 25th division on Suva if we can get both of these guys there. But we do. We would likely want to replace their those units in Pearl with something new um, to form up the 25th division. Nadi also has a considerable amount of troops there. We've got the 7th Australian Brigade, which is made up of 1942 Australian infantry sections. So that's actually... Those are, hot. Those are the best quality Australian units you have at this point. Then we've got the 1st Australian Infantry Division, uh, which has 42, 42, 42. So actually, these guys are all regulars as well. So the 1st Australian Division as well. Uh, that's a, a decent unit. Again, they're fairly green, but they're, they're decent in terms of uh, their equipment and whatnot. Um, and so we have effectively about one division and a reinforced brigade, uh, although the division is a little under strength. So I guess I'd say this is like one full-size division of regular Australian troops plus a U.S. field artillery battalion at Nadi. And then in the adjacent hex at Suva, we've got effectively about two-thirds of an infantry division, one brigade of New Zealand troops, one regiment of U.S. troops. It's about two-thirds of a full division there, as well as a couple of field artillery battalions and regiments to support so all told, I would say on the uh, island of Suva, we've got about three divisions worth of troops. Um, and uh, that would that's sort of our one of our strong points. The other is Pago Pago, which has been weakened a little bit because we did dispatch a regiment to Savi, the 8th Marines. We also dispatched a regiment to Vavu, uh, which was the 2nd Marines. Um, and so we've got regiments on Savi and Vavu, or Va Vavu. Uh, and then we've got a couple of defense battalions for coastal defense, the 34th Infantry Regiment, some base force units, uh, basically about two regiments worth of troops on Pago Pago. So this is our this is sort of our, our breakwater, if you will. The Japanese have advanced further than they did historically, taking the Espirito Santos group, taking the Elise Islands group, taking Canton Island. So we set these units up to build a line to prevent their drive south. The island of New Caledonia did fall to the Japanese. That was nominally part of the Fiji line that I had originally established, but I didn't get any real reinforcements to New Caledonia. I think we got one Indian regiment in there uh, before it was attacked, but that was about it. And it was under strength. It was sort of a, 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 what would you call it? An orphan regiment that had been butchered elsewhere. And we just pulled them into New Caledonia and they helped defend there, but New Caledonia did fall we did put a couple of battalion. We put a battalion at Norfolk Island. And we put a battalion at Lord Howe Island to try and 
put a little bit of a of a wall between New Caledonia and New Zealand. I don't think they would drive down to New Zealand. That is so far out of their wheelhouse from a supply perspective. I think the Japanese would be they'd be running a very narrow gauntlet between the forces on Fiji and the forces on Australia. Uh, to try and like thread that needle to keep New Zealand supplied. We also just frankly, we've got some troops at uh, on the island of New Zealand. We've got about a division and a half of troops, including a U.S. tank battalion, actually two U.S. tank battalions, so quite a bit of armor, some heavy, heavy firepower. Uh, one of those is actually Australian, I think, or New Zealand, I think. Uh, but in any event, we've got like 60 Valentine tanks at Auckland. We've got, I want to say like 100 or 36, well, a little bit short, uh, U.S. Stuart tanks, um, and then a series of different regiments and uh, and defensive units there, U.S. combat engineers. Uh, plus, we've also got some additional forces a little bit f- uh, in other parts of these islands, like Wellington uh, has a couple of New Zealand brigades, although I believe they're all militia. They're not as good, um, but they're still troops, I guess, uh, and then some additional armored units here. So we've, we are, we're building forces on New Zealand, but we've thrown... A battalion at both Norfolk and Lord Howe is sort of a, a, an attempt to prevent a drive south from New Caledonia. Though I don't think it's likely they would drive that, that direction. Also, neither Norfolk nor Lord Howe are good islands to take because they've got very limited port facilities. You can see this one doesn't even have a port capacity. It's a zero out of zero. You've got a, I don't even know that you can build a port on Norfolk. It's like it must not have an anchorage or something. Um, and then uh, Lord Howe does have one port capacity it's it's natural port is zero but you can overstack and build a port in some hexes where there shouldn't be a port so we've got a very small port there that can hold like six thousand tons of shipping um both of them are decent airfields which is interesting they can both serve as airfields to support any drive on, on new zealand but not good shipping locations so i don't think you could really have like a strong offensive coming out of norfolk island because even if you had a decent airfield here, a level three airfield, or even if you overbuilt it to four, you wouldn't be able to bring enough supply in without the lack of a port to keep the, the bombing raids running. I suppose you could unload over the beach with an amphibious task force, but it still would be very inefficient. So those are kind of, that's our defensive line in front of New Zealand. It's also protecting our shipping lanes to Australia, which have to divert further south because of New Caledonia being in Japanese hands. Uh, we've got Penryn Island, which is kind of part of that defensive line here as well and then the line shifts north through christmas island and palmyra we've actually brought the is this where the canadians are no it's not we've got a a couple of marine defense units here christmas island has the 13th canadian brigade the canadians really didn't fight in the pacific but we do at least their ground units i don't think they did but we did deploy some canadian militia here on christmas island so i'm sure they're they're really they're really thrilled um, we also, we lost Baker and Canton. We retook Baker with a very small force, a small landing party. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can retake Canton because right now we've got to divert our shipping east of sort of the line islands here in Christmas Island and Palmyra, which are sort of acting as our defense for shipping, but everything's kind of got to go east of those to prevent being picked up by Japanese float planes out of Canton or potential raiders out of Canton. I would like to retake Canton that would push our front back west and would give us a much more relaxed shipping corridor to Australia with the exception of the the New Caledonia diversion that we'd have to make. How does the game prevent you from stacking 20 divisions on an island like Wake? So depends on the island. Um, Midway, for example, eight at, first off, when you land on an atoll, so there's different kinds of islands. Atolls have a stacking limit that is much lower is, Mid- is Midway considered an atoll? No, it's an island base, I guess. Um, so Midway can have up to six, or no, maybe it is an atoll. Midway can have up to 6,000 troops without penalties. We've got a little bit over that. We've got 6,200 men on Midway right now. Um, I'm kind of surprised it's that many. We've got three. I don't know if those are there's what, three battalions of troops on Midway right now, and then a base force and a coastal artillery unit. So we're a little bit over the the stacking limit here, which gives you a penalty when you're attacking or defending. But basically, like if you land with too many troops on an atoll and you if you don't take it right away on that first turn, you get huge, huge combat penalties. 
Um, and so that's something to consider. Like I'd have to dig through the rule book to see all of the specifics, but it is a major penalty if you land on an island with too many troops. Um, and if it doesn't fall right away, your troops get butchered. So it is, it is different islands have different limits. Midway, you can see there was 6,000 Pearl has no limit. So Oahu has no limit. Um, because it's a much larger island, like feasibly you could put five divisions there and be fine. Um, so you can see we've got 68,000 troops on uh, on there. Um, and then you can see Christmas Island is a, is a, is a also apparently a larger island. It has an unlimited amount. Uh, Baker, I want to say is an atoll, and it has a 6,000 troop limit. Um, Pago, what's the limit there? unlimited it's a larger island so it all depends on the size of the island i mean if you look at islands like you know okinawa for example the americans put tons and tons of troops there uh and so that wasn't really a concern but again it all depends on the island uh, and that's like one of the reasons why if you land on tarawa for example you're going to take disproportionately higher casualties because tarawa was an atoll with a low troop limit you know basically your troops are crammed in on the on the beaches but in terms of troop limits if you're fighting in a hex and New Guinea, not really something to be as, as concerned about. Um, but yeah, this is War in the Pacific Admirals Edition, guys. I know some of you guys probably haven't seen this before. You probably hear for Ultimate Admiral. Uh, but this is this is an older game. Every single turn is one day. So it is May 11th right now. When I end this turn and send this to my opponent, the next turn, the next turn result will be for combat that took place on May 11th. And then we'll get the May 12th turn back. You can do, I think, up to three days per turn. But it is absolutely bonkers. Um, the only place you can buy it, Alex, is Matrix Games website directly. So the, the publisher developer is Matrix Games or Slytherin. But I believe they only sell it on Matrix Games website. They haven't put it on Steam. It's a 12 plus year old game. It's a little bit finicky sometimes to get the resolution or the things like that correct. It is priced like a big board game like it, i wouldn't when you're looking at pricing usually it's like in the 80 dollar range they do typically run it on sale three or four times a year well they drop the price down between like 10 and 15 bucks or so so like it might be worth waiting for a sale if you're interested but it is an old game it's finicky it's one of a kind there's no other game like this in the pacific theater in my opinion it is one of the greatest war games ever made but that's just my opinion that's just like your opinion, man. Um, and it is showing its age. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever get a sequel. The developers behind this have also made War in the East, War in the East 2, War in the West. Those games are available on Steam. Um, and they are much more modernized and better UIs. But they also simplify a lot of stuff that War in the Pacific doesn't, doesn't simplify. And so, like, if you really want this... Like, they're still crazy detailed, crazy, like... The designers behind these games, and I'll stop in a second, guys, because you're probably bored with hearing this, but like the mindset, Joel Billings, who's the head of 2 by 3 who's the company that makes this game, the mindset that they have is very much that these are these are inspired by, like, I don't know if you guys have ever seen those huge board games that would, like, take up a whole garage and not basically weren't playable because they were so detailed. I think there was a really famous North African game like that where, like, it just modeled absolutely everything. Um um, but like they basically view this game as like those mega board games, like those incredibly huge, incredibly detailed board games of the seventies and eighties. Th th when they designed this game, it was like, we're going to make essentially a digital version of that. Um, and so that's, that's basically what these games are. And to a lesser extent, I would say war in the East and war in the West are that, um, they, they take things a little bit a little bit more abstractly it's like week long turns instead of day long turns um they don't they tend to abstract out the naval combat cuz that wasn't really a huge part of the war in the east and then in the war in the west like okay there's the u-boat campaigns but that's not really what the game is about it's about the land campaigns and you know the germans weren't going to stop the american navy at d day <laughs> that wasn't going to happen um and so they do abstract some of that stuff out uh, it still plays a factor in those games um there's another game i would say that's similar to this which is even more finicky is bombing the reich which is basically very similar to gary grigsby's war in the pacific except it is a uh, combined bomber offensive in europe 
during during World War II from 43 to 45. And that's a game I do kind of want to feature on the channel, but unfortunately, the way it resolves turns takes way too long for it to probably ever be a live stream. It will probably just be on the, on the YouTube channel. But in any event, yeah, these are 40 by 40 mile hexes. So if you're wondering like what each one of these hexes is, each one of these is a 40 by 40 hex. But I think that's enough of me rambling tonight. So we're going to go ahead and wrap this episode up here. I hope you guys did enjoy this War in the Pacific Admirals Edition episode. Uh, an episode where Albacores died. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching, and I'm out.